Hello, everyone. In this lecture 19, I will continue on the topic of stress relaxation from large step shear. Uh, in particular, I will emphasize the nature of the ultra strength softening that produces non-monoticity and uh, show you that even the two model can produce uh, at least uh, this uh, feature, although this two model cannot anticipate any non-quiescent relaxation. So here are the topics I will go through them. Uh, I will emphasize uh, from the movie what new insight we have gained and how we would like to interpret uh, the stress relaxation behavior. OK. <coughs> I'll get started. All right. Um, there were a few questions from you by email. Uh, let's see, one of the questions. I see that, uh, OK. One of the question was the, the idea you see is the middle layer is going to the, to the right. The top and bottom layer tend to go to the left. And the question was why. But basically, what you need to remember is, oops, is your, mm, there is the pen option, but it's okay. There is a pen option. But basically, the point is your sample has been sheared. Oops, has been sheared. What would it do? Have I had it has been sheared like this from. From, right, the initial dash line has become the solid line, right? So you sheared it. And now it's going to break. It's breaking at the point that the sample is still being elastically strained. So, of course, uh, one part, w uh, oh gosh. Of course, one, uh, the, uh, one part of the sample will go this way, the other part will go the other way. Okay, if there is a breaking here, this part will snap back. This part that's being sheared will snap back that way. That's the simplest case. If you're breaking more than one place, then that's what you saw. The, there were two plates breaking. So basically, keep in mind, before the breaking occurs, it was still being elastically deformed. So uh, the breaking is what allows the elastic deformation to relax quickly. And that is the reason you could produce a long time, a lower stress state. So uh, there were a, a few points to clarify. You know, for example, this whole uh, subject of uh, uh, part three is about large deformation. It's about after large deformation. And what do we mean by large deformation? Well, it, we mean by which, by, what, by when the strain is large enough, the so-called elastic yielding and decohesion would occur. If it's not large enough, it would not occur. So, of course, I have yet to describe carefully about this concept yet. But in short, just like that movie, which involves about three times to the edge move, if you just uh, move one edge to the right and make a movie, there will be nothing. The sample will not break up. So large means large enough so that your structure could break. OK? There was another question about uh, why uh, H should decrease with strain. Well, that's just a matter of going back to the definition of what is H. H is defined here, right? normalized by something that is independent of gamma. So basically, H would decrease with gamma means G, the relaxation modulus, would decrease with gamma. Reading from here, what does that mean? Reading from the, de from the original definition of what is G, what does that mean? Can you tell me? If G is not a changing with gamma, of course, that's a linear response, yeah? Because that means the stress is linear in gamma, not changing. Now, G or H is decreasing with gamma means what? 
well, means, of course, it's nonlinear. Yeah? Well, it further means that, uh, it, that your stress will increase with gamma weaker than linearly, uh, because it's decreasing. So there's no, uh, so, so you, you, okay, you may ask why it decreases with gamma. That is a question yet to be answered. But what it means to decrease, it just means you have uh, started to see nonlinear response. Question? Right? Because linear response means this will be a constant. And we discussed that this would be true when you have a linear response. This is a constant, right? Okay. Anything else I need to clarify? So, let me get out of, uh, we can discard this. Uh, and let's get out, and so now, so, um, so I want to now go a little uh, deeper into uh, this phenomenon. So uh, we will be really patient uh, because this chapter 12 is where I intend to describe almost everything in the chapter. If you know from previous chapters, I skipped a lot of uh, t uh, detail parts to save some time. But here, this chapter is so important. And the discussion is so relatively straightforward or at least uh, 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 it deserves our attention to, to know all the details uh, so that I uh, wish to explain every part of what's in this chapter 12. Uh, in particular, this is a important point in the course where I uh, clearly I recognize this is the place we should start to speak about the tube model. Uh, gently, very slowly, start to know what it is. The reason we have to do that is because it's not avoidable. For example, in this, uh, in this slide, uh, this red curve, uh, which in this uh, PPT, where all the figures I copied from the book, uh, this top figure here, the red line, is what the tube model says. Take a quick look on that. Remember, I had indicated that the damping function, if it's dropping too fast with gamma, that is uh, really going to be a problem. That P being stronger than minus one. Look at what this red curve shows. It shows it has the tendency to decrease. This is double log, right, as you can see. It has the tendency of decreasing with gamma as 1 over gamma squared. The slope is 2, minus 2. OK? So if you uh, plot this h, if you plot this h function, Sorry. If you plot this H function, oh, oh, oh. Oh, where is my pen again? If you plot this H function as as H multiply gamma, then this red line becomes this one. Okay. This will have a slope of. Why do they? I know why. It is still the fact that I need to turn off this thing. It's double counting, right? It has a screen sensitive mechanism, whereas the, the PowerPoint itself also has that mechanism. So uh, this will have, this will have a, a slope of minus one, because it started with a slope of minus two. I multiplied one gamma, I still have a minus one. Uh, that's why you have a maximum. You have a uh, non-monoticity here. So before I uh, uh, intrigue you with what the two model is all about, let me just speak about the data. Remember I told you that 
I was very excited to know that the literature, some of the literature, show data in agreement. Oh Lord, it's trying to save or something. See that little circle? Oh, some of the literature results, experimental results, are in agreement with the tumor. So clearly something needs to be looked at, so we went to the lab and uh, get hold of a sample that doesn't undergo much wall slip and did something typically literature does not do, which is to report the stress build up to the different strands and watch how the stress relaxes at different strands, okay? So this is actually is the raw data. Uh, in contrast, the typical literature will report the G instead of the, the raw data which is this figure on, on the right. Uh, either way, you could uh, appreciate something very deeply uh, uh, troubling. So if you go to the conventional way, look at the G, uh, this TK really means that there is a kink. I know I, I, know I draw it poorly. this TK really just means that there's something like a kink here. So indeed, for this black line, you see there's a kink. And the Gs are all smaller than the Gs in the linear response limit. That's this envelope. So you may already typically call this a strand softening. And uh, it, it, this behavior clearly look like it's a strand softening because, because all the uh, response, so here, strand softening, because all the response are, are, are weak, sorry, the response, meaning you lose basically uh, more stiffness as you use higher strands. So it, they are all below the zero they are below the linear response line. Okay? <clears throat> so we are here. I was talking about there is a uh, kink uh, that, that can be produced when the strand is large, and they are all below the zero, the, the zero strand or linear response limit, and this is a, a strand softening, if, if you may say that. And this is just to conform to, you know, or to demonstrate to you that uh, if you don't plot uh, stress directly, this is what you typically see. Um, other than the fact it's strength softening, you wouldn't necessarily know anything quote unquote unphysical. Well, there's nothing unphysical in a physical world, unphysical only in the sense uh, not agreeing with what you knew. <laughs> the, the fact, if you, mod, if you convert, as I last time lectured you, uh, you should be able to recover your stress, and you find what you find. You find this circle, which involves the higher strands, at the green bar point, has a stress much lower than several of the strands there, right? So if you plot your raw data, true stress, uh, the stress, at the, at the what? This is probably about 70 seconds. At that point, and read these points, that's what you get, the circles. Okay? And uh, uh, it's now monotonic. The higher stress, uh, the higher strand one had a showed a lower stress now, as the raw data showed. And that's, if you were me, seeing data presented this way, you probably start to become alarmed. But since typically it's plotted in this way, you wouldn't know. Okay, you, you just know somehow you lose a lot of stress and the sample tend to be uh, less stiff at long time. So remember, G is a modulus. It means nothing but some time-dependent stiffness, relaxation modulus. 
And if you further take a movie, since we know something must be terribly wrong, and you saw movies last time, if you take a movie of it, as you did here, okay, if you just moved 1.2h to the right, that's the triangle, well, it shows sample hardly moved over time. So this is just a plot of how where a particle moved away for uh, after uh, watching how it moved away for a certain amount of time. By the time you sh shear 2.5 units, okay, by the, by the time you shear 2.5 units, these particles moved away from originally here, right? They moved here. They moved here. The particle here moved here meaning the sample moved. At different height, they moved. What I want to emphasize is that 2.5 is this point. It is a point before this, this decline has occurred. Okay? So obviously, you don't need that decline for something disastrous to happen. The decline just means more disastrous things happen. No, for example, that's the higher strength. Look how much more moved. It moved many, you know, fractions of a, uh, of a, a millimeter. Remember, the gap is only one millimeter or less. Okay, so enough of uh, what the, uh, this, this type of data uh, indicated. Um, Right now, it's necessary to say a few things about, uh, it's still part of the history. The history was, as I indicated to you, uh, in fact, as our own data shows, our own data more or less tracked the tube model, right? Because that circles more or less is on the tube model line, okay? And in the past, there will be, in the past, meaning prior to this work, which was in the middle, uh, uh, mid-2000, uh, prior to this time, uh, there will be a subset of data in the literature that agrees, that agrees uh, with, with this uh, theoretical description. Okay? There will be a subset I emphasize a subset of data agreeing with the theoretical description. We, uh, the theoretical, I will give you details about it. And then there will be other sets of data involving different conditions, different people, or different systems that do not agree with the two model data, uh, two model curve. Uh, and here is a, a really biased uh, 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 report that people will take the data that support the tube model and say, hey, look, in fact, this is the, I learned as a student, expert in the field admit the same thing, that this is the, uh, the agreement of some data with the experiment is being uh, held as the greatest triumph of the tube model. It is the most impressive success of the tube model. It's a problem is so hard that we are just pleased that there are such a thing where, where the tube model can explain. Okay? But keep in mind, as I said, there will be data that does something like this. In fact, I don't remember whether we already previously presented such a day. I, I only went through the book. It was in the radio recording. I mean, in the recording that we had it. But there are data that would look like a blue, okay? That, that, that has nothing to do with the tube model. We tend to, uh, in fact, such data would occur first, and we tend to ignore that and we'll present a set of black curve, uh, data that will agree with the, green, the red. 
That's the situation. Let me now try to explain the miraculous coincidence that occurred between data and theory. It's miraculous. It's a miracle. So let me go very slowly on this. I want to sort of uh, remind you on lecture 13, I started to indicate something about the tube model and even tried to indicate it that we will come back to talk about the tube model in terms of in terms of uh, uh, the, uh, the origin, if you like, the origin of the overshoot, you know, this is a piece of image, the origin of the overshooting startup shear, the origin of another type of The origin of another type of non-monotonicity, uh, non which you went through. Remember, I motivated about, two, about shear bending that way. The other non-monotonicity, look, there are three non-monotonicities that you have seen. In, uh, when I say you have seen, I should try to clarify that two model can produce. One, in startup, it can show an overshoot. If you recall, I, mean, I know I, I kind of, it's hard for me to demand you on this. I indicated Maxwell recognized this point as yield in 1979, but it's also the year the two model explains overshoot to come from a different source. That has nothing to do with structural breakdown, and therefore, Maxwell's uh, 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 idea become forgotten. Nobody cared about his idea of yield until we independently picked up uh, due to the fact that we observed the shear banding. So here's non-monoticity number one. Two models can produce, okay? Remember, in startup, it can produce a overshoot, okay? Number one. Number two, I indicated in lecture seven, 13 that there is another non-monoticity the tube model possesses. That is, if you watch steady state stress, which is to take this point, at different rate, you find the tube model says there is a non-monoticity. And that's troubling because how, it's a similar trouble. How can you shear faster to steady state and the stress is lower? Unphysical. That's total, that one is truly unphysical. How can you have that? So you can, and therefore one has to rescue it. And uh, uh, we can talk about more details about basic rescue it, find some other effect. And basically, I even explained to you that it, it, this feature will uh, allow you to anticipate shear bending because because this part is unphysical. If you apply a, a, a nominal rate at this negative part. The system can only split into high rate and low rate uh, to satisfy the condition of, uh, of your upper surface uh, moving with, uh, with the, the V over H in this negative slope range. So that's uh, non-monotonicity two. The third non-monotonicity, non-mono, Plasticity, non-mono, yeah, monoticity, mono, monotonicity, monotonicity, yeah. The, the, the third non-monotonicity is, is this one that I just reviewed for you by constructing gamma over uh, H. In fact, in the two model, this has a name called the orientational function. Okay? It just so happened. 
So the two model uh, showed three nomenticities. I'm telling you today, the origin of the three nomenticity is all the same. And I will explain what it is. Okay, so there are three nomenticities. And it all has to do with having a tube. All right, you've got a tube. Okay, and today, of course, I can uh, uh, frame this in a, in a much better uh, language. Remember, uh, this is uh, much earlier in a, a lecture, I indicated the central let me rephrase it in a different way. In the issue of rheology of entangled polymers, there are just two core questions to ask and to answer. can say how elastic deformation arises. There are so many ways to, write, to, to say it. You can say it any way you want. Awesome. Arises from entanglement. Remember, if you go to an earlier lecture, I phrased that two questions by using the word, by using the concept of affine deformation. So this question is the same as asking where does affine deformation come from? Okay, I'm just verbalizing it. I save some time. Okay, how uh, elastic deformation arises from entanglement? This is the second way to say it. If that's the case, when do you cease to see elastic response? There are just, I love the English language. There are just so many ways you can say similar things. And, and using very entirely different words, uh, but, okay. To, uh, 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 when do you uh, seize, okay? I, I, I see uh, uh, some student uh, uh, need to Google on this word, just like shear scission. Seize, meaning stop seeing elastic response. When does that happen? Well, you can say, due to this entanglement, right? If entanglement was what gave you an uh, uh, elastic deformation, perhaps it's the disentanglement that caused you to lose uh, 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 elastic deformation, right? Yeah? Uh, this should be the two questions to ask. It seems that the two model was not designed to ask those two questions. I know this is a very strong statement. Uh, well, let me tell you what two model does, and then you can judge on your own. Uh, the two model basically imagine any test chain, which means any chain, lives in a tube. How does uh, 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 elastic deformation or whatnot occurs? Well, it occurs because the tube uh, can undergo a, a fine deformation. Okay. How they can do that? That's assumption. We don't know how. It just does it. So because it, we don't answer how, we are not addressing the first question. We're not addressing what enables an entangled polymer to undergo elastic affine deformation. We just assume the magic tube will allow us to do that. And 
if you cannot answer that question, then it's hard to answer the question of when uh, you uh, are unable to deform your sample elastically. So, as I said, the tube model start with two assumptions. The tube undergoes a fine deformation. Second, which is a core assumption, uh, in absence of anything else to visualize, which is, this is the core uh, assumption, okay? L listen to this one. This one basically uh, imagines that this uh, chain in the side of the tube is a Rolf's chain, so-called. In other words, it's a chain that uh, inside the tube is unaware of any entanglement. So it has a, uh, it obeys dynamics according to Rolf's. So as Rolf's chain, the test chain will relax Uh, at least it will relax on the Rolf's time scale. Top okay? At least it can do, should do that. This means the following. This two assumption would mean the following. That, that uh, you can fastly stretch your tube. Okay, suppose you, you manage to, you know, we do step strength. Step strength, remember, is to mean that it takes a time negligibly short compared to tau, compared to tau r, compared to anything you have. So imagine you suddenly produce a large amount of strength. Because you assume the tube will allow you to do that. And then, so you produce a lot of strength. Let's say 5H to the right. The tube will tilt 5H to the right and stretch whatever it does in a fine manner, okay? And then it says, oh, hold on. You, do that. you have done that. You have produced that at TI, right? By the time of TI, you have produced that. Huh? But hold on. By the time so, so now, now you produce a large gamma within the large amount of time. Now you are sitting there, and now you're going to wait for what happened. You're going to answer what happened. The answer is here. You wait until time approaches tau r. And according to the second assumption, the chain will start to relax. Okay? Relax, there's only one way to relax. If the chain is highly stretched, they want to relax back to the non-stretched state. Okay? So, the consequence of this two statement leads to the third uh, uh, reiteration of what is said. Basically, so there will be Rouse retraction. The chains will retract around T Rouse time. Okay? So the consequence of that is if you build a lot of stress, if I uh, present it in the way you like, you, you build a lot of stress there. It basically says that stress will, or a large part of that stress will vanish around Rolf's time. And that is the king. That's the experimental kink. In other words, when you go to experiment, you find there is a kink, okay? 
when you do the tube theory, the tube theory prescribes a kink around tau r. Because chains was highly stretched when you first finished stretching, or finished the, the shear. And that corresponds to a lot of stress. And then around time of uh, arouse time, all that much, uh, a great deal of that much stress is relaxed over that little time scale of tau r. Now, imagine you have done this give you a curve. Let's say imagine you have done this for a lower strand. Well, it will do the same. Relax there. And it will do something like this. So the short answer is the two model give you a prescription of where this universality comes from. I used that word last time. Uh, it's not a common way of saying it. The reason after some tau k, the relaxation are the same, is because according to the two model, chain beyond that point have all retracted back to the unstretched state. The subsequent relaxation are the same as linear response. In other words, it will retract to the point that the chains are no longer stretched much. And that's the limit of linear response. So the subsequent relaxation is all just the normal, let me use that word, and all, all, all just the normal diffusion that produces the relaxation. And they are all the same. So, Here's the, the theory uh, developed sort of independent of what was the data there that basically produces two things. One is the, there will be a kink. Secondly, after the kink, the relaxation behavior indeed will be similar uh, no matter what strand you used to produce this. If you use higher strand, the kink will be sharper, will have a more stress drop, but subsequently, the behavior is the same. OK, so we're done. We're done, except uh, there is only one thing that I haven't told you about, except why, where, where does the non-monotonicity come from? I told you there are three of them. So perhaps the easiest one is to talk about the third one. Third one I claim is this one, right? I claim this is the third one, the step strand one. So here it goes. According to the two model, a chain, uh, w w when you first did it here, okay? The chain is highly stretched and oriented. Okay, it's oriented in the shear direction. I just, let me just give you the imagination of what it is. After tau r, it retracted. Let me redo this. It retracted to here. What did I do that are the same? It retracted without changing its orientation. So the orientation is still very high. Why it's high? Because you use the larger amount of strength. In other words, this orientation does depend on how much strength you used. Okay? The more strength you use, the more tilt toward the flat direction as you go. Consequently, 
after the retraction, what's the remaining stress is dictated by how much orientation there is that you have produced. And then, if you, I don't expect you to recall, but if you go to the recording, I swear I use that word. And then, this two non-monoticity are all results of over-orientation. In other words, this first non-monoticity occurs because beyond this point, the chains become more oriented. When they become more oriented, it picks up less stress, or if you like, it resists less to the shear now. That's the theory. I'm just, I know I didn't show you the mathematics, but I'm showing you this concept. It becomes more oriented and resists less to the deformation, therefore the stress, by definition, resists less means there's, it, 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 it produces, the way to see re, uh, resistance of deformation is through stress. So you see the stress dropping because it's the same, um, uh, synonymous with the, uh, the word that they uh, uh, resist less. It's the same as saying stress drop. So this is due to over orientation, as I just explained to you. This step strand could also produce over-orientation such that, such that I could have a one that undergone kink and eventually have a stress that's lower. That is on this side of the curve now, okay? And that's possible again by the explanation that the chains become more oriented. Once they become more oriented, there is less stress stored in it. You allow more stress to disappear, you end up seeing a lower stress. Why you end up seeing a lower stress? Because you have more over-orientation than the green and the red. Why you have more over-orientation? Because you started with the chain that's more stretched. And you started with the chain that's more stretched and more oriented. The stretched part will retract, the orientation will not. Okay, so I have explained two non already. The first one and third one. The second one is the same. Second one is a little bit tricky. This is a plot of the stress in steady state versus the rate you used. What, me, what does that mean beyond this peak? It means at a higher shear rate in steady state, my chain, by definition, has less orientation. Sorry, more orientation, less resistance to flow. As I apply higher rate, this is very easy to imagine. I use no shear bending to speak about. Just think about I shear with higher and higher rate. Higher, higher rate means WI is higher. WI is higher, remember, it just means that the chain is deformed more in some sense. So in any case, in steady state, you can imagine a higher rate I use, the more oriented the chain will be. So the same feature, when you use shear rate that's too high, you will have over orientation, your stress will be less, and therefore there will be a maximum again. So I have succeeded in explaining the two model give you three non-monoticity. Fascinating, it has all of it. We can go home, it's done. The world of nonlinear and tangle polymer reality is done because we have everything. We have overshoot. We have 
outro transophony, which I indicated matches with some experimental data. Not all, but some. Of course, the struggle for a long while was why this subset do not agree with your model. That was a struggle. And thirdly, the second non-monoticity is a little bit funny because it implies you have shared binding. So if I re you recall how I reviewed it, this encouraged people to look for shared binding and we never found it. We never find it up to a certain point. Well, by now you know what point. End of the 2005. So in some sense, minus the idea that this is not in agreement with experiment because we didn't find shear bending. See? Because if you have the second non-monoticity, you should have shear bending. That's the idea. We didn't find it, so we start to modify that part of the theory. But the first one and the third type of non-monoticity is there. It's explained. It seem to agree with experiment. Well, the trouble there, as I said, repeat again, only a subset agree with the experiment. So if you are rigorous about what's going on, you would definitely say, how, how can I have, have a theory that covered a fraction of the data and cannot explain the other part of the data of, of a different system? So that should have been troubling. But none of this uh, was being taken seriously to uh, suggest that we have some uh, very partial understanding of the, of, of the subject. Uh, that's not my impression. Um, perhaps continue not to be the impression of many. But I laid it clear here what's going on. Well, so far, you must be, I, I think at this point, I must have kept you in suspense, meaning you must be extremely curious about what's going on here. In other words, let's say I have zero understanding to share with you. I have offered all the information you have seen so far. The tube model, the movie even, and the data that shows non-monoticity, what do you do with it? How do you proceed? I mean, of course, you know, if you, you are a... Hmm. I know it's always, it's in science, uh, it can be hard to make progress, but of course you, you should bo be bothered that the, that the, 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 the third type of non-monoticity, only some data pr produces non-monoticity. Here's the philosophical aspect. And of course I will mention about the more troubling part when you have the movie. The philosophical part is this. You have data agreeing with your model it must mean your model is correct. Because they agreed. That is in absence of some data that doesn't agree with the model. In fact, if you have a set of data that doesn't agree with the model, that should be very troubling for you. Of course, you may say, oh, this data is because you have wall slip. Then you can blame the experimentalist, you see? I keep telling you guys doing experiments, don't report artifacts, <laughs> okay? If this is due to wall slip, I will blame the experimentalists who are reporting incorrectly what they are, because the guy who reported this didn't know they have wall slip. Of course, if you know, then everything is done. You take that wall slip into account, blah, blah, blah. So you can see right now, it's very unsettling. Maybe all this data involve wall slip. In fact, that's partially true. So that the response was much weaker and so on and so forth. 
That's partially true. But, uh, but then comes a move, because I came with an idea that, uh, let me use that word, beyond this point, on this side, I, I would use the word unphysical. In other words, it's unacceptable for the stress to, to decrease as your amplitude increases. It's unacceptable. Of course, that was the reason we did the movie. Now, you have the movie. Then what? Well, then you know what. First thing first, in either theory or previous experiment, we have only, in our mind, we are only able to imagine that the relaxation is motionless, no motion. We call it quiescent relaxation. And of course, this result shows it's non quiescent. Okay? So for us, of course, by the time you see this thing is non quiescent, sample breaks in front of you. Then you, of course, is acquiring a great deal more insight than anyone else who hasn't seen the movie, who hasn't seen such non quiescent relaxation. So let me just show you a couple more movies to, to uh, Oh Lord, uh, wait. Uh, to uh, 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 to give you a break because we talked so much about uh, the issues. So the fact that you have uh, non-quiescent relaxation is is of course unexpected, uh, theory-wise or experimental-wise, and. Um, Uh, it, uh, uh, of course, uh, yeah, it takes take this long. I better not mess up. Let's see if, uh, uh, let's see if it plays in this mode at least. will play. So I, I know your eyes may not be so quick. The reason I want to use play mode was this will give you something bigger. But uh, need to loop them so that at least they can play again and again. So for those of you, I have stared at this movie many times, so I can tell. So it turns out that you can see this was moving almost 5H to the left, OK? And you can see before I reach 4.8, when I stop, the sample already broke, actually. OK? And that was the question that uh, Don asked the other day. It basically, by the time of reaching 4.5, I already went beyond the maximum. You know, the stress overshoot already occurred. And therefore, shear bending occurred even before it break. But it's more dramatic because when you stop, it just take advantage of that break and immediately try to recall. Right? And subsequently, you see all the interesting relaxing, recoiling, and, and healing. I, I spoke about a key clue here now. In fact, let me borrow this. A uh, movie to express the rest of what I have to say. The good question to ask is this one with this movie. That's a question you really ought to ask. You ask, why stop? Of course, this, the sample is breaking and they have motion. You ask, when does 
the sample become motionless. Well, who can answer that for me? It was breaking. Of course, there was motion going on. I mean, you had that movie. You had even this movie. Uh, which was easier to handle in some way. You can see in the beginning it's moving, it has motion. I'm asking, when does it stop making any movement? When? Because when you answer that question, you also answer the question of what happens when the motion is no longer there. OK, so go ahead. Can you try? When does it stop making any movement? Don't stare at the movie, because the movie will eventually tell you at some point it stopped moving, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> that won't tell you anything. Think, therefore. This motion will not continue. It will stop. When? Why? Why it stopped? Well, certainly I know a limit it will stop. Remember, this is all about, let me just be real clear with you. And this is how much shear you did, for example. And let's say, you, as we said, there is one part that may break. And if it breaks because this part, it's just like a rubber band. In extension, I know it's always easier. If I stretch a piece of rubber band, if somebody cut it in the middle, of course the two parts just goes back, OK? In shear, you should think about the same thing. The shear is being elastically sheared this way. Of course you want to go back if you, let, if you have a break. So it will try to move back. This will try to move back, OK? At some point, it will stop because there's very little. Ret <laughs> you already went back so much, there's very little left for you to go back to. That's an easier way of saying it. I know the answer to this question is somewhat difficult, but it shouldn't be. Even before you use the idea of very detailed theoretical corresponding theoretical picture. The following layman language is permissible, the following. It's a language at the continuum level. You have a failure. You have a break. You can at least ask when that failure, that break, heals, yes? That's all there is. If I, know, if I don't even worry what caused it to break, to have failure, it does not, that alone does not prevent me from asking when it heals. So your sample is not solid, this won't heal. I'm sorry, this won't heal. But your sample is not like that. Right? Your sample is liquid. It's just a bunch of chains inserted into each other. So you may be more curious how it break, but you should be less curious why, or less curious. It should be more obvious to ask the question, how, to, ask the question to anticipate that you should heal. So why do I emphasize this point? It's because this is a, a miraculous, this is a very important point. Let's go back to our data. This is the figure where you did the movie. And indeed, you see all this relaxation behavior is all the same. The relaxation behavior here are all the same. Why? 
because the sample has healed. A simple way of saying that is after some motion, which is very dramatic, of course, because you're not supposed to see it. After those motion, when it heals, you can imagine that state is not very far from a linear response state. So I can use the rubber band example, right? If I stretch a piece of rubber band and I cut it, your rubber band, of course, will snap back. Well, essentially, it will snap back to a state where very little deformation occurred, right? That's the linear response. So it's the same thing. It was, the motion will stop when the chance is in a state of not very much deformation anymore. And then the rest of the deformation will relax just like linear response will do. So here is another way to think about data. Then let me ask you lastly, what is this kink? Please, this you must answer for me. What is this kink? Whatever, at the high strand there is a kink, right? Where do I talk about kink? There is a kink. If you go that back to my, where is it? There, there is a kink here, yeah. So I'm asking what is that kink in, in your new physics, if you like? Please, I, 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 won't, I won't go further if you don't answer. Where is this kink from? Now you have the movies. What produced this kink? You may wish to ask it differently. What does the kink mean? What? Well, it's a quick loss of stress. Yeah? Did I hear the word? A quick loss of stress. So what is this kink? Caused by? What? It's due to the failure that we observed, yes. It's the failure that allowed the sample to snap back. It's just like you have a cross lean rubber, you try to cut in the middle, the sample will go snap back and you lose all the stress. Right? After all, that was why I went back to the lab 15 years ago to look for. To look for that failure that will produce a faster stress drop, such that I could observe something on this side. Isn't that the whole thing? I want to right now remind you, in contrast, this notion of breaking and whatever is, of course, absent in the two model. The origin of the, there is a, a, a deceivingly similar uh, 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 language, if you like. So in the two model, what produces this? It is the Ross retraction. Why it retracts? Because in the two model, there is nothing to balance a highly stretched chain. The sample just, the, the chain just wait for Ross time to to have a chance to relax. And of course we perceive all chains, all the horses are the same. Nobody can win the horse race and the relaxation and retraction occurs 
uniformly identically for all chain. In that limit, it will be motionless. Okay. Questions? Yes. What a po what 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 a question! So in this movie, what do you mean by the fact that this relaxation is non-quiescent? What do we mean by that? You can answer your own question. What do you mean you have motion? Okay. Remember, the particles are just there to treat, to allow you to be to allow the sample to be seen. I wouldn't. Uh, Travis, uh, let me. I, I wouldn't use the word collective. I would use a much uh, naive word. Remember, the gap is one millimeter. The particles, I maybe omitted, are tens of microns in size. I shine a laser through. If it's a transparent sample without particles, there will be nothing to scatter my laser. My field will be totally dark. So the particle was there just to reflect the laser, right? And you observe motion on the millimeter scale. If, therefore, the word I use is, yes, we are talking about continuum concept here. There we go. It's a continuum concept. It, this movie speaks zero about molecules. That's why I was saying that. I was asking, gee, if you see something breaking, at least you can also say, say something about healing, again, without invoking anything molecular. Healing, right? Here we go, that word. So, right, so, so this is the phenomenology. The rest is a question of how this millimeter scale motion a reveal for you, meaning what can you speculate and start to build some idea based on such a movie. Okay, uh, I think I uh, uh, covered a lot today, I meaning it's, uh, we're still on the topic of, uh, of uh, uh, oh, 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 we can say a last word before I finish. We're still on the topic of what you observe in shear case after a large step wise shear. And at this point, perhaps you will allow me to use the word elastic yielding, which I have not yet uh, said anything about. Again, I will say a word about this phrase without going to the molecular level. Yielding, you already know, it's a concept that uh, uh, exists for a continuum. It's a continuum concept. It just means structure is falling apart. Who cares what that structure is at the moment? Elastic here is, you can amplify that word. This yielding was elastically driven. That was what it means. So why we see it has a yielding? Of course, we say it because, uh, because we saw the sample breaks apart. Okay? So after step strand, we see sample breaking apart. That is obviously a failure of the structure. Therefore, it's obviously some yielding taking place. But I want to emphasize, it's rather different than yielding you observe during ongoing deformation. Right? That's what you previously observed in a startup. 
So I, I uh, don't think there is a better word. So this yielding is being perceived to also occur without ongoing deformation. If we just generally borrow the word, yielding means the structure break apart. Very key difference, right? One is during deformation, ongoing. One is without deformation. And of course, this is a much more remarkable case. That yield can occur in absence of anything. They're not deforming anymore. And therefore, how it can yield? Well, it's because, it's because you already elastically deformed it. So this elastic deformation is the cause. When it's large enough, when you do it fast enough, such that it can be treated as a fine. I know the fine, the concept of a fine had to come back many times in the future, but basically, you imagine the chains are deforming just like the microscopic uh, system is doing. OK. So I end up with that note that uh, we have, you can claim, in fact, this movie does allow you to claim that because, because you do see the, chain, uh, the system recoils. OK? This is all elastic recoil. Therefore, the word elasticity should be there. The word yielding should be there. So I know in the recording, the, the, the camera goes to that side. So let me move it to the side. OK. I, uh, for the sake of the recording, I, I will just stop here. And you can have some questions.